Hello and welcome. Uh, before we begin our presentation, the Temple of the Winged Lions Cultural Resource Management Initiative, Lessons in Sustainable Preservation, Accessibility and Community Engagement from Petra in Jordan, myself, Jack Green, and my co-presenter, Glenn Corbett, wish to thank the organizers of ASOR and the session for coordinating this online component during these challenging times and also to acknowledge the impact of the global pandemic, including on the people of Jordan and particularly the Petra region, whose livelihoods are so intertwined with cultural heritage and tourism, which has been impacted greatly by COVID-19 over the past year and a half. We also want to want, wish to dedicate this paper to the memories of Bert de Vries and Tom Parker, who both passed away in 2021, they contributed so much to the study and preservation of the history and archaeology of Jordan. This presentation is about community based preservation at the archaeological site of the Temple of the Winged Lions at the World Heritage Site of Petra in Jordan. Since 2009, ACOR, the American Center of Research in Jordan, and its partners have developed innovative and inclusive approaches to working with and providing training the local communities in archaeological heritage documentation, conservation, site management, social engagement and education through the Temple of the Winged Lions Cultural Resource Management Initiative. With emergency on-site interventions complete as of 2018 and attention now shifting to evaluation and publication efforts, this short presentation provides an overview and insights into sustainable preservation of endangered cultural heritage and the important role of local community engagement. This presentation reviews key sustainable preservation, accessibility and community engagement goals and reflects on lessons learned during the initiative, which may be of interest to other projects. The story of the site goes back several decades. Firstly, to the American expedition to Petra, directed by Philip Hammond between 1974 and 2005. Over 21 seasons, the AEP carried out excavations in Petra, where the ruins of a major Nabataean sanctuary, the so-called Temple of the Winged Lions, were unearthed. After the death of Philip Hammond in 2008, Chris Tuttle of the American Center of Research launched the Temple of the Winged Lions Cultural Resource Management Initiative in response to the major conservation needs of the site, as well as for continued needs for excavation, survey, research, and publication. Glenn Corbett, alongside co-director Elena Ronza, and then myself, have subsequently served as project directors of the TWL CRM initiative. The initiative develops as a collaborative project between ACOR, the Department of Antiquities of Jordan, and the Petra Development and Tourism regional authority alongside other partners. Close to $1 million from US governmental sources has been committed to the preservation, accessibility and training efforts at the Temple of the Winged Lions through ACOR. 800,000 has come from the US Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation. And um, that was between 2011 and 2016 and approximately $170,000 was provided through the Sustainable Cultural Heritage through Engagement of Local Communities Project, also known as SHEP, between 2015 and 2019. And although specific amounts are not known or have not yet been quantified, significant in-kind support was provided by the Department of Antiquities and the Petro Development and Tourism Region Authority. And this really gives a sense of the long-term costs of conducting preservation and training initiatives, as well as the potential economic impact of such projects on local communities and local employment. So to briefly introduce the site, the Temple of the Winged Lions is situated on the northern slope of Wadi Musa, overlooking the ceremonial and commercial center of Petra. And it dates to between the first and the fourth centuries AD. And as you can see in this 2009 photograph, the temple surrounded by ancient structures as well as lapidaria and spoil heaps from the American expedition to Petra. The temple cellar yielded findings including statuette fragments and stele, wall painting, stucco decoration and elaborate capitals. 
Those which originally elaborated the columns around a central podium featured winged lions, which give the Temple of the Winged Lions its name today. Surrounded buildings to the north and also to the west have a domestic character, although with apparent evidence of, uh, though also with apparent evidence of worship workshop activities. In the southwest quadrant is a large subterranean arched space and to the north, a paved plaza with benches called the North Court. Although the focus of worship at the site continues to be debated, findings suggest that Nabataean female deity Al Uzza was prominent there. This famous stela of the goddess of Haiyan, thought to represent Al Uzza or Alat, was found in the temple cellar. Hammond wrote much on the question of the temple's function over time and the deity's worship there. And an up upcoming article in Near Eastern Archaeology. Uh, on the Temple of the Winged Lion summarizes research to date on this important site, including through publication preparations, which have been taking place at ACOR through the assistance of the TWL Publication Fellows, Pauline Perot Fournay and Marco Dana, and project interns Safa Judah and Nora Al Omari. A recently announced National Endowment of the Humanities collaborative research grant obtained by ACOR will lead to a future publication. Well, at the close of the AEP excavations, and despite a focus on site conservation over several seasons, the site remained in a poor condition. It was difficult to access the cellar without climbing over the exposed remains and deep holes posed a danger to visitors. The site lacked signage and it was difficult for visitors to interpret. The rubble slope in the southwest quadrant was in danger of collapse, and some of the columns in the cellar were found to be leaning. Moreover, the cellar platform, minus its original tiling, was exposed to the elements. Another major problem exacerbated by poor drainage is the presence of salts within the sandstone blocks, which has impacted their surfaces following changes in humidity and climate. In short, the site was endangered through its excavation, and continued exposure over many decades. It was clear that something needed to be done to help preserve this site and also to make it safe and accessible to visitors. So this in turn led to work carried on uh, at the site through the TWL CRM initiative to make it safe, preserved and accessible. I don't wanna to spend too much time on these aspects just to briefly highlight the physical interventions that were undertaken. Um, one of the aspects First of all, landscape rehabilitation. Um, one of the aspects of sustainability in preservation was the repurposing of on-site materials of past excavations for conservation needs. The sifting of the AEP spoil heaps by team members, which can be a visible intrusion within the landscape, provided a, a source of ready, clean, ready and clean soil for sandbags to help stabilize vulnerable parts of the site. And in the process of sifting the spoil, many artifacts were found, which add to the archaeological data for this site. And while not all spoil heaps have yet been removed, a significant volume was repurposed for conservation. Excavation and stabilization, the southwest quadrant. So excavations carried out on the site in the southwest quadrant helped clarify the geological instability of the adjacent slope, as well as finding that the area had been used as a masonry reclamation dump soon after the fourth century earthquake. A large buttress of sandbags and soil was used to support the rubble slope, which was in danger of collapse, and the quadrant was backfilled and drainage channels were added. This all helped to stabilize the site and improve rainwater runoff. The Ashlar masonry of the temple cellar was conserved by a team guided by conservators, firstly Christina Danielli and then Franco Cirilli. Uh, solutions to the drainage and salts problem in the temple cellar included the provision of a mortar capping uh, for the temple podium and backfilling of the cellar has helped to improve drainage of rainwater away from the site. Uh, two leaning columns were braced with support. So the cellar is now safe and accessible to visitors. Site safety and interpretation uh, to create pathways and to design and install signage helped visitors to safely navigate, understand, and to visualize the site. This included the installation of signage, 
and this was also an, there was also an opportunity for uh, local students to conduct a visitor survey of tourists at a peak period in visitation just before the pandemic hit, which has helped to understand the effectiveness of this, these paths and the signage. Yet all of these interventions didn't really happen just on their own. They took the efforts of many members of the local community alongside governmental authorities and specialists and consultants from outside. What was achieved was not only physical work, but also the building of skills, knowledge and education. And now I turn over to Glenn Corbett regarding the principles and ethos behind the initiative and aspects of sustainability um, of this initiative, which go beyond the physical work. Thank, Thank you very much, Jack, for that very nice uh, overview of the results of uh, the project over the past couple of years. Um, I'll be talking about more about the social and community engagement aspects of the project. So the TWL CRM uh, developed an innovative social engagement strategy that directly involved members of Petra's local communities in the preservation efforts. The project trained 300 local community members in tangible vocational skills related to heritage preservation, including documentation, conservation, excavation, and landscape rehabilitation. Indeed, it is precisely these sorts of skills that the Jordanian Department of Antiquities and the Petra authorities insist are so essential for maintaining and preserving a site like Petra. The TWL CRM also created an equal opportunity hiring system. Anyone who wanted to join the project could put their name on the work register and was listed according to their community, tribe, and family so that opportunities were offered to as many different segments of the local community as possible. Equally important, the project had a gender-blind hiring policy, allowing a rare opportunity for women to join a meaningful work related to site preservation. Indeed, since the project began in 2012, more than 60% of the local team has been made up of women engaged as conservation technicians, documentation specialists, and pottery processing technicians. The TWL CRM also adopted a tiered pay scale by which all who joined the project started with a basic salary that could then increase based on acquired skills and earn responsibility. Perhaps most importantly, the TWL CRM worked hard to make sure that each team member felt they were contributing to something larger than themselves. The project spirit of cooperation and teamwork nurtured a more egalitarian work environment that tended to soften the often rigid social and cultural barriers that traditionally separate men from women, foreigners from locals, and wealthy from poor. In the field, team members of all backgrounds worked together to achieve project goals, while outside they met regularly to socialize, go on field trips, and engage the broader local community in Petra's cultural heritage. In short, rather than further the divisions and hierarchies that have traditionally characterized many archaeological projects, the TWL CRM encouraged teamwork, cooperation, and mutual respect. Next slide. Finally, the TWL CRM sought to play a more positive, constructive role within the broader local and Jordanian community, particularly regarding cultural heritage education. In addition to organizing family days during which team members brought their children to the site to learn about archeology span and preservation, the project also regularly hosted local school groups and even university archeology span students to participate in hands-on learning activities. By 2016, through the Experience Petra program, we were also experimenting with bringing local school groups from across Jordan, as well as foreign tourists to the site to allow them to participate in the project while also having meaningful interactions with the local community. Indeed, in 2017, with support from ACOR's USAID SHEP project, nearly 300 school children participated in the on-site learning program. With that brief summary of the main results of the TWL CRM, we now turn to a few lessons learned over the years, along with some concluding observations and recommendations that we hope can benefit future preservation projects, whether they're in Petra or elsewhere. As mentioned earlier, the funding required for preservation is significant. Huge financial and stakeholder resources have been committed to the Temple of the Way Alliance, with nearly $1 million going towards the preservation and accessibility of the site over several years. And even with all of that hard-earned funding, there remains much to be done. One source of sustainable funding for such preservation projects is of course tourism dollars, with for example, a portion of all ticket sales going directly to fund preservation efforts within the Petra Park. 
While in principle a good idea, the model requires a strong uh, management structure and financial sustainability, which unfortunately can be impacted by fluctuations in tourism, as was shown during the years of the Iraq War, the Arab Spring, and more recently during the global pandemic. Therefore, given the investment and commitment required to preserve such sites, perhaps the first and most obvious lesson of the TWL CRM is that archeologists must be ever mindful of the heavy burden that site maintenance and preservation places on local authorities and communities. Excavation, no matter what it reveals about the past, can create a host of preservation and maintenance challenges that can be extremely costly to address, especially over the long term. As such, archeologists should not undertake excavation unless there is a clear plan for site management, protection and publication, supported by sufficient financial and specialist resources that meets the needs and requirements of local management authority. Otherwise, archeologists should simply leave things where they are in the ground. Next slide, please. The TWL CRM was also able to promote positive change in how archeologists, authorities, and especially local people themselves understand and view the role of the local community in archeology. span Yet the project for all the good it sought to do still had to confront the question of sustainability. Simply put, when the project is over and has no more funds to pay salaries, who or what will be left to ensure that the local community remains engaged in heritage preservation? We are hopeful that a sustainable solution to community engagement may be offered by local community-based organizations or companies. For example, CELA for Vocational Training and Protection of Cultural Heritage, a nonprofit organization based in Umsehun, helped develop and implement its first community and training program in site conservation and preservation at the Temple of the Way Alliance between 2015 and 2017. Today, CELA continues to work on preservation, training, and community engagement projects across Jordan with the goal of creating pools of local te technicians who can then be engaged to meet the routine and long-term preservation needs of archaeological sites. The formation of such local organizations and nonprofit businesses has shown that local communities can play constructive roles in heritage preservation. But for such models of community engagement to be viable across the long term, more established cultural heritage stakeholders and especially government authorities will have to foster a legal and professional environment that recognizes local communities as equal partners in heritage preservation. Foreign aid projects often aim for ambitious lofty goals that while well-meaning in their intentions and aspirations simply cannot be sustained without years of continuous investment and shared commitments between foreign actors and local partners. In the case of the TWL CRM, while much of the critical on-site conservation, preservation, and maintenance work was achieved, there are still many elements from the original site restoration and rehabilitation plan that would require additional funding and field work to complete. Equally important, the project's focus on on-site preservation and engagement activities seriously hampered and delayed publication efforts, which have only recently become a priority, while hundreds of recovered artifacts and finds still await proper processing and study. And several well-conceived programs and activities, whether a women's sandbag cooperative, the short-lived but highly successful daycare in Um Sehun, or our experienced Petra education program are now idle, shelved until adequate funding and support can be found to sustain it. With those realities in mind, we end with a few recommendations that we believe can promote more sustainable preservation projects going forward. First, from the project's outset, it is essential to establish strong, durable partnerships with local authorities that explicitly serve the needs and goals outlined in existing management plans, such as Petra's 2019 Integrated Management Plan, supported through UNESCO and many other local stakeholders. These partnerships should not only formalize respective commitments and obligations, such as through signed MOUs and agreed upon action plans, but more important, ensure that local management staff are fully integrated into projects goals, objectives, and day-to-day -day operations and decision-making. Second, both foreign actors and local partners must enter such projects with their eyes wide open, with a clear, realistic sense of the amount of time, staffing, and fundraising required to fully meet the project goals and objectives. 
As we've noted throughout, such preservation projects require incredible resources and organizations must be committed to staffing and financing them across the long term, even for decades, if they are to be successful. Finally, if local communities are the key to sustainable preservation, as most all now agree, then those communities must be viewed alongside foreign specialists and state authorities as equal and legitimate partners in the actual work of site preservation and maintenance. This means making space for local organizations that prioritize community-based vocational training and ultimately the formalization and democratization of the CRM employment sector. And with that, uh, Jack and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And we of course welcome your questions and comments during the live Q&A session at the upcoming uh, ASOR virtual meeting. We also, again, would like to thank the many partners, organizations, and donors who have supported the TWL CRM over the past decade, especially the Department of Antiquities Jordan, the Petro Development and Tourism Region Authority, ACOR, uh, the USAID SHEP Project, U.S. Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation, and of course, the many team members from Petra and elsewhere who made all of this important preservation work possible. Thank you all very much. Thank you.